Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring Sys Admin Expert, Don Pizzette. DevOps Engineer, Justin Dennison. Security Specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. All right, hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. I am your host, Peter, but the other couple of people that you saw in that intro, besides Don, who's here uh, above me, how you doing, Don? I'm doing swell and you know excited that we kicked Daniel and Justin out for the day. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Daniel and Justin not uh, not here yet. They'll be here in a little bit when we do the news, but we are joined instead today by Cherokee Boos over there. Hi, Cherokee. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for having me today. Your hair is exciting. And uh, we have Mike Roderick as well. Mike, how are you? All the way from your house. Oh, that's not Mike. Hey there, Peter. <laughs> How's, uh, is, is my hair as exciting? It, uh, sure. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but you guys are here because we're talking PowerShell today because the month of May, we're, we're all about PowerShell right now. And we said, hey, we should bring you on because we have a special guest. We actually reached out. We said, let's just, let's just you know, set the bar high and we'll shoot for, for the top. And we said, Let, we're, who's the father of PowerShell? It's Jeffrey Snover. Let's, we'll, we'll send a message to him. And apparently he's very bored right now during the pandemic <laughs> because he actually replied and was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go right now. So Jeffrey, how you doing? Welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm doing great. How about yourself? Uh, we're we're hanging in there, and I, I assume you're you're just home right now and uh, and filling the time how you can. Absolutely, actually, never busier. The, you know, never been more busy. Actually, really it's crazy. Oh. Yeah, not not even when you like made PowerShell. <laughs> You know, I do keep seeing people <laughs> posting about like, oh, I'm getting so much better at yoga and stuff, and I don't understand how they've generated more time that I don't get. It's the commute time. You're, you're cutting out. I mean, there are people that commute an hour a day each way. And if you're getting two hours right. back, that's not I bad. guess I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you're not putting that time to yoga, Don. I'm spoiled. I'm only 10 minutes away. Like, that's not even fast enough to eat McDonald's. No, that's not. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get to know Jeffrey for those that don't. And, and uh, for those that do, we'll get a little bit more in depth with our first segment, Rapid Fire Questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Jeffrey, those uh, were not the questions, don't worry. Uh, so first, I just kind of want to start with, uh, you know, going back to when, when PowerShell first came to being. I know, you're, you know, you were involved from the beginning. So how did that happen? Is this something you raised your hand and said, hey, I have this idea? Or did someone else come to you and say, here's, here's what we want you to do? Can you walk us through a little bit about uh, where, it came, where it came from? Yeah, so there's sort of an evolution to it. It started off as I just came to the company saying, we needed command line scripting, and uh, they didn't get it, right? And so I bang, 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 bang. Finally, I remember this one meeting where my executive finally got it. And she said, okay, yes, this is very important. Now I understand why, which 10? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, which 10 commands should we write? I thought, oh my God, this is gonna take a long time. And so this is this inevitable journey. And uh, there's a lot of detours along the way. By the way, Don Jones is writing a book, A Shell of an Idea, where he's talking to all the original people and he's writing all the details of that. It's a long and storied past. But the heart of it was that Bill Gates was just beating us up about .NET, 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 .NET. And, um, and so I decided, well, I got to find out what he's talking about. So I went and started doing some exploration and discovered the, the concepts, the core concepts of the object pipeline, of the you know, uh, 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 reflective or adaptive type system, et cetera. And those formed the, the foundation of PowerShell. And then I just needed to get it funded. And there was a team called Kermit that they were going to do a shell. Basically, they were going to take K shell and port it it to Windows, and I said, "Hey, I, I have a better idea." And um, they didn't understand what I tr I tried to explain it, explain it, explain it. They didn't get it. So then eventually, I said, "You know what? Just go away. Uh, uh, come back in a month." And that month, I wrote like a ten thousand, fifteen thousand line demo, and I was able to show them all of the core principles of PowerShell that you see today in that demo. And when they saw it, they said, "Yeah." And then that's that's when I got it all in. I went and did that. So did you name it? But by the way, I had to, I had to ch change organizations, and in the process, got demoted. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you want to work on this, that's great, but uh, we're going to take a pay cut. So what what were yeah. you doing? What were you doing before PowerShell? Yeah, so I was what they call an industry hire. So basically, you know, Microsoft wanted to get into the server business. They had a big problem with management, 
right? And so they said, you know, they had a number of reviews with Bill and Bill said, yeah, you guys don't seem to know what you're doing. And so why don't you go hire some industry talent in the space? And so that's when they reached out to me and hired me as the uh, architect for the management technologies and products. And so I've been doing that for a few years. So what have, what have you been doing uh, since then? Where, have you been involved in PowerShell the whole way? I mean, I know we talked last oh, no, week no. about some iterations and things. Yeah, so yeah, so yes, I've been involved in PowerShell uh, all all the time. But uh, you know, after having PowerShell, I went back and became again the chief architect for all the management products and technologies, and then was asked to become the chief architect for Windows Server. I mean, Windows Server, right? <laughs> My joke is, you know, that's what you put on the front of your tombstone. On the back, you're like, oh yeah, loving father and husband, whatever. <laughs> but on the front, you put, you know, chief architect of Windows Server, right? Because it's only been three of us. Right. And this is pretty interesting. There have only been three chief architects of Windows Server, and all of us were consulting engineers at digital. So that's an interesting piece of history. Anyway, they were Dave Frickin' Cutler, Bill Frickin' Lang, and then me. And I have no idea how I got on that list, but I did. So, every yay. Frickin snow. <laughs> well, every time I hear your name, though, it's associated with PowerShell. Are you more proud of? Oh, I thought you were going to say with the on, F on word. <laughs> 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 Whenever I hear that name, F and Snowbird. Yeah. Like, are you more proud of the work that you've done uh, on, on Windows Server, though, than, than the PowerShell stuff? Well, you know, um, it's a different skill set. I think, uh, you know, we did, I'm very proud of the stuff we did there. Uh, uh, but obviously, I didn't have as, as uh, fine, a, you know, as strong a hand in it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm we're super proud of that work. Yep. And so I did, did that and then Azure Stack. And then about a year ago, I decided to make a really big change. And uh, so I looked around, decided, and uh, so now I'm in office working on the intelligence substrate, which is, you know, AI layer for office. Nice. Well, I know we've, got, that. we've got Cherokee and Mike here who are like super fanboys and fangirls. They have the picture <laughs> with you. But this is what true. was it? At, uh, Ignite last year or the yes. year before? And the year yeah, before. And, and the year and before, the not year or. Before. Okay, you've got pictures with Jeffrey. So I know you guys have some questions. Yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, Mike, I just kind of jumped in there. If um, <laughs> talking about projects, have you ever had, like, I assumed that PowerShell was your favorite, but, you know, even just like talking to you now and seeing how you react to different projects, do you have a specific project that would be like your favorite or aside from PowerShell? So just maybe like a passion project or something that you no, had you a know, personal I tell you, connection the, with. The original uh, days of PowerShell, I mean, we did an incredible amount of hard work thinking through. We wanted to be interactive and programmatic. We wanted to like, hey, what's the separation between outputting and formatting and different device models? And so there was this group of us and we spent a lot of time in each other's office, uh, learning from each other. You know, Bruce Payette, oh my God, the guy has an encyclopedic knowledge of all the languages you can possibly imagine. Wow. Some topic would come up, he's like, well, you know, they tried that in Snowball and that didn't work. And so there's this other language and they did it this way. And based upon this, I think we had it as like, wow. And so those periods of, that period of time where we were generating the core concepts and flushing out the, you know, putting flesh on the bones of the core architectural principles of PowerShell, I think really rate right amongst my favorite uh, times. I mean, now that said, I am always excited about the stuff I work on. Sure. Uh, you know, the new AI stuff. Oh my gosh. Wait till you see what we're doing. Yeah, I actually, I'm sorry, Mike. I'll, I promise I will uh, I'll I'll wait, let Mike. go. <laughs> wait a second, wait a second now. Um, <laughs> well, just kind of thinking about that with the AI and the work that you're doing with the substrate and just having that capacity to be able to create, you know, those relationships based on the AI, how do you think that may impact, uh, just knowing that capacity and knowing that, you know, that robustness, um, how do you think that may impact projects moving forward at Microsoft with everything that's been going on lately? I just feel like we've obviously seen some vulnerabilities within our, um, you know, ac across the globe with this pan pandemic that we've had. And I just wonder how that's yes. driving any initiatives or changing yep. um, security wise or anything like that. Yeah, so if you've if you've been following me, you might have heard my joke. That is, Microsoft's incapable of sustained error. Now, internally, when I tell that joke, I'll always add, you know, that. Uh, but sometimes it takes us a couple decades, and uh, we continue to screw up remote work. 
which is to say we Microsoft has a culture where we're not particularly good at remote work. And then you talk to anybody's at Microsoft for a while, they will tell you stories about great people that then had to leave the company because they had family responsibilities that took them somewhere else. And we just didn't we couldn't accommodate them. Well, we are being forced into the future, right? It's a, a thing we probably would have dragged our heels on for another decade. And COVID-19 is forcing us into the world of remote work. Now I'll tell a little story. So we have a new owner for teams, right? So we had a reorganization, new owner for teams. Used to be uh, his boss would hold this meeting and he was in it and we were all in this big conference room, 40, 50 people, you know, having these vigorous conversation. And then there's a Teams link and a bunch of people would be online like, hey, Hey, I'm trying to say something, trying to say something. Yeah, ignore them, but you have a conversation. Now we're all on teams, right? And so we're on teams and uh, the guy who now owns teams is trying to make some comment and he can't get in. So in the, uh, in the chat window, you see him, he types, he says, uh, we really need that raise your hand feature. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> Two weeks later, raise your hand. Okay, so the point is, as executives now, we're all living the life we're, and, and we're making the tools better. Uh, and so we're going to get, I think, again, I think this is going to turn into one of those moments. You know, Microsoft is, is really good at taking something they are really bad at and turn it into something we excel at, right? Did that with the internet, did that with security. I think you're going to see that with remote work. I mean, it wasn't that we, I mean, we had great remote work tools, but we didn't use them as much. And I think as you see, we use them, they're going to get orders of magnitude better. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. All you, Mike. Yes. And by the way, right, uh, the, the, the nice thing about that is that then it improves the lives of everybody, right? Opens up economic advantages for people uh, in places that otherwise couldn't do it. Allows people to uh, balance their work uh, and their home lives, uh, you know, really this is, uh, you know, technology and service of people and society. I'm really excited about that. Sorry, I interrupted. Hey, Jeffrey, I saw your, your, no, that's fine. I, I saw your presentation at Ignite last year on the Office 365 Intelligence Substrate. Impressive yeah. stuff you guys are doing. Um, how would you sum that up? If you were trying to describe that to somebody, give a little elevator pitch. What would you, how would you yep. describe that to people? Yeah, so I'd say it's a people operating system. Okay, well, what's an operating system? That confuses people. An operating system manages resources, manages access to resources to multiple people, provides services and common controls to applications, and then provides a base set of applications and a way to get new applications. Now, typically, when you talk operating system, you're thinking of a device operating system because prior to this, that's all you ever had. And so the resources you manage were disks and CPUs and monitors and stuff like that. Well, a people operating system does does those three things, but all around people. So we manage as people, we manage their resources, their chats, their emails, their conversations, the things that they share. We provide a set of services. Well, what services? Services that connect people, mail, calling services. These are available as APIs, as controls. We have common controls like the people card and the file card. And then we have a set of applications, uh, the kind of core applications, Office, Teams, you know, uh, all that great stuff, Outlook, and then a way to get new applications running in those things. So it's a people operating system. I like that. Okay, we can do that. Now, if you had to, I know oh, wait, there's a lot of back, them. And it, it goes back right uh -huh. to the heart. I mean, is I love this area because it's so close to the core mission of the company. The core mission of the company is to empower every person and organization to achieve more, right? And that's exactly what we're going to do is we have these great tools that help people do more. And now what we're going to do is we're going to open that up to the ecosystem so that everybody can participate to empower the world. So, you know, one of the things that Windows does is it makes it where I don't have to worry about the hardware on my system anymore. Windows kind of deals with that. So with the substrate, yeah. now I don't have to worry about people anymore, right? I can just <laughs> <laughs> focus on me. It's all, about it's, it. all about, it's all about you, my friend. It's all about you. Well, it, it's almost scary sometimes because I know that my bosses can see like what files I've worked on recently or the fact that I haven't opened anything up recently. <laughs> um, I don't know if I like that. That's the bigger <laughs> issue, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Jeffrey. so, Jeffrey, if you had to pick one, I know you got a, a lot of commands there in PowerShell or a lot of features that are, would, do you have a favorite? Do you have something that you go, man, I think one of the coolest things about PowerShell is, 
Is it just the object, the pipeline, See, or anything? Well, I'll tell you uh, an aspect and then a command. So first, the help, of course, is the most important command, and I use it all the time. But there's one piece, of, one concept that I came up with, which is this notion of uh, the should process pipeline, should process return call. It says, hey, should whenever you write a commandlet that you're going to have something that has a side effect on the on the world, you say should process. You tell me what you're going to do, and you tell me what you're going to do it to, and then that's the Ports, minus confirm, minus what if, and minus debug. Because you call should process and it returns a Boolean. If it returns true, you do the action. If it returns false, you don't. So when it says minus verbose, what happens is underneath the covers, we write out, hey, um, this is what just happened. We return true, you do the action. If you say minus what if, we say this is what would have happened, return false, you don't do the action. Or if you say minus confirm, we say, do you want to do this? Yes or no? And depending upon whether you say yes or no, we return true or false. Anyway, the incredible value like and what turned out to be about 10 oh. lines of code. Sorry, I was thinking like red pill, uh, blue pill situation there, like what you do, like what, what the outcome would be if you did versus not. Oh, say that again, I missed that. Oh, like on um, the matrix. The oh, matrix. Yes, yes. Yes, exactly so like if you correct. go down this path or this path, what that final outcome would be, so. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, a lot of PowerShell was informed by this horrible, horrible business trip I had to the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center, <laughs> where we, we they were, this company was using my pre-release software from the startup company I had to run a hospital, run a hospital. And it didn't work. And it kept oh, no. blowing up. And I spent like nine days there, sleep, literally sleeping on the data center floors, hospital administrators waking me up like, oh, we have patients that can't get into, can't be admitted. You got to get. And I remember three in the morning, I'm ratty, I'm terrible. Uh, and I'm there and I'm stitching together the database records. And I see this one record says gunshot wound abdomen. And I had to find the other piece and stitch it together. And I was like, man, this really matters. I'm not at my best. And these tools aren't helping me. And so uh, that that was the heart of PowerShell, of a lot of PowerShell. Mm. That's why it's a little bit more verbose than some people prefer. Because at three in the morning, when you're in bad shape and it really matters and you open up a script, you should be able to read it and have clarity, right? If you're in that situation and you open up a Perl script, best of freaking luck, my friend, best of freaking <laughs> luck. That's not gonna be a happy night. That poor guy with the gunshot wound abdomen might not make it. Anyway, wow. so that's what informed it. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I never thought that's, really, that's really awesome though. Yeah. Jerky, I was gonna say I never thought I'd say that if we didn't if that guy hadn't been shot, we might not have PowerShell today. So. I know. So <laughs> much innovation is driven from like, you know, just desperation, it seems like. So and that's pretty geography <laughs> <laughs> and desperation. Memorial Hospital. Wow, I didn't know that was a place. Mm. <laughs> so Jeffrey, yeah, I gotta ask is. now, is I believe uh Jason Helmick now is, is project manager of PowerShell. Yeah. Is that right? Is that amazing? Yeah. You guys you guys have a great rapport when you're out there in Ignite. Do you do you have that rapport at Microsoft? Do you go down to his place and and the same idea there? Absolutely. Yeah, I love collaborating with him. In fact, we're working on. Well, let's see how much of this I can talk about. So we're working. We did this very very popular uh, training series on PowerShell version three, and then we haven't updated because really, you know. The basics are the basics. But we thought that there was an opportunity with version seven to redo that. And so we're doing that. And then there's some very, we have some very innovative ideas. Um, we'll see whether they work. They could be terrible. <laughs> but I have this hypothesis for how we can transform uh, training and uh, learning technology. Um, so watch that space. Definitely. Yeah, you can you can say as much as you want here. No one listens. <laughs> so feel free to, to throw out any. You know, your secret's safe with us. Uh, so we're hoping those things. Actually, are sure. Why not? Yeah. I'll, if you want, I'll do it. Go ahead. What do okay. you got? So here's the hypothesis, right? So you're there and we, we train, uh, like, oh, here's my talk. So you attended my Ignite talk, right? Told you some very cool stuff. What did you do with it, right? Did you remember it? Like, did you go back to the office and try it? And if you did, what, what did you do? Like, could you remember it in your head? Of course you can't remember it in your head. So then you go back to the video and you're like, uh, and then you pause and you type. And, and, and so the point is, between the delivery of information and someone exploring that information, there's a huge gap, huge gap, huge amount of friction. So here's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is, hey, let's um, do the training 
Let's do the presentations using a Jupyter Notebook, a Jupyter Notebook that then is available to everyone. So I'm there, your Jupyter Notebooks have markup and description and then code, and then you can run the code. So it's a mixture of documentation and code, and then you can run the code. And the idea is like, hey, uh, I will give a talk and show the code and then run the code, modify the code, run the code, but then give that to you so that you can then follow along. And, and then you'll see there's some other things I won't talk about, but the idea is that ultimately we wanna to get to a position where you come into a session and the first thing you do is, hey, everybody, point your browser at this page. And it doesn't matter what version of the operating system on, what, ver what operating system you have, what version you have, whatever, everybody has the same environment and can all play along while the content is being delivered. I think it can revolutionize uh, things. That sounds amazing. Could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've yeah. I hope there's an ignite again soon, so we can uh, <laughs> learn about the idea. Oh, there's a digital yeah. one. Yeah, there is a, a digital one this year, so maybe maybe we'll find out more then. Hey, so I know everyone that goes to that talk is excited, and and uh, you know everybody loves PowerShell, but there's always the few that you can't please, and so we wanted to kind of cover that in our next segment here while we have you, uh, and that is our mean tweets segment. So I don't mean, even have an mean intro. tweets. Yeah, I don't Excellent. have an intro for that because it's the first time we've done this one. <laughs> but uh, so we we want to read you some of the tweets. Uh, that were hard to find. There's not many people out there. Uh, you know, we've helped more than we've hurt here. Uh, so we want to read you some of these and, and get some feedback and and, uh, and and see if you agree. So Don, Sounds you great. go first? All right, I'm going to take the first one. This one is from uh, Twitter user Cartoon. Uh, you know, high level of technical... Well, I guess we have no idea about it based on the name. Uh, and what <laughs> he or she said was, PowerShell really kind of sucks for string parsing. <laughs> Feels so much more limited... Maybe I just don't know how to use it well enough, but Z, apparently they fell asleep while sleeping. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, first, uh, I'd say a little too specific with that comment. Text parsing sucks. That The whole point of PowerShell is, hey, don't parse text, deal with the objects and just refer to the properties you want. So that's sort of the heart of it. The degree to which you end up having to parse text means, hey, somebody delivered you something in a way you shouldn't you didn't want to have. And so you go talk to them, say, hey, give me an object instead. The second is actually we have about the same capabilities of text parsing as Linux, so regular expression support, et cetera. Uh, so it's a little bit more verbose than awk and set and, and grep, but uh, but it's there. And uh, new now with the WSL, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, those tools will be available and callable from PowerShell. So happy days, your life is going to get better. Yeah, Speaking of person. WSL, I think that's yeah. uh, the next mean tweet that I have here. It says, Dear Microsoft, PowerShell sucks. Stop trying to make <laughs> us use it. WSL supports Bash integrated with what? Hashtag WSL, hashtag Linux, hashtag Power, PowerShell. And yeah, so here's, a, oh my, and who's that? Um, Nazgul Senpai. Yeah, I was going to say it. I'm like, I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> no, Nazgul Senpai. Nazgul Senpai. <laughs> here's the deal. Like nobody's forcing you into anything, or really, honestly. All, the only thing we ever care about is the success of our users. Now, it's interesting to think through. I, I, at some point, I did the back of the envelope calculations, and we had spent hundreds of millions of dollars on PowerShell. And here's the point. Monetization strategy equals zero. I mean, from the beginning, from the beginning, our heads and our hearts were always pure on this. Make people successful. So we've reported it. We, when we delivered it, we didn't say, oh, you have to have the latest version of Windows to get it. No, we got it available there, and then we made it available down level. Now we've made it available on Linux. So we all we care about is the success of your products. At some of success of you. At some point, we had somebody say, "Hey, when should I convert my VB scripts?" I said, "My friend, why would you ever? Like, if they're successful, if you like VB script, if you can do what you want, go with God. Use that. If you bash, get, it makes you successful. Go with God. Use that." Our observation was. Boy, there's a lot of people that can't be successful with those tools. Text parsing, too hard. Bash, too obscure, uh, et cetera. And so we have a set of tools. And if they work for you, great. But do whatever works for you. There's no, there's no religion here. There's no passion. The only passion is like helping you be successful. 
Well, you guys heard it here first that God uses Bash and Visual I, Basic Script. That was my takeaway. <laughs> well, well, funny you should say that. So, so, well, we're we're trying to be like really hardcore about the style guide, right? A certain limited set of nouns, set of verbs, etc. And so the joke was, uh, you know, what would what would Jesus type? <laughs> When Jesus wants to delete a process, what would he do? He'd say, get process, where handle count equals. Okay, well, give him, give Jesus what he wants. <laughs> All right, Mike, what do you got? All right, Jeffrey. Uh, yep, I've got one from at Burgers. Uh, he says, the only way to attach an existing OS disk or VHD to a new Azure VM is through PowerShell. And that yeah. sucks. Yeah. You are correct. Here's the model. <laughs> We want to make you successful using whatever tool you want to use. And the reality is life is lumpy. Life is lumpy. That is a commitment. We're going to get there over the course of time. And then um, again, what you'll see is that some organizations are a little bit ahead on this tool, other organizations a little bit ahead on that tool. But it is our commitment to make uh, the set of functions available independent of the tool you use. The only caveat with that is um, the command line and scripting uh, stuff will always be the full comprehensive set and the GUI will be a subset. Um, that's just because of simplicity, et cetera. But yep, uh, and progress is lumpy and it's always gonna be, the world is a messy place. It always has been, it always will be, but that's, we'll, we'll get a cleaner year after year. All right, go with God. And then, and then make it messy again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the last one here, uh, my favorite, that's why I picked this one. Uh, it says, those who invented PowerShell must have been using, uh, using bad drugs and their brain got damaged severely. <laughs> hashtag PowerShell, hashtag sucks. Uh, and this is from Levlin. Uh, so now that I know you were at the Elvis Presley Memorial <laughs> Hospital, I feel like I have an idea of what drugs uh, you were on, but... Uh, no, you know what it was? It was like eating eating out of a vending. Have you ever eaten? Your only meals came out of a vending machine for a week. Oh my God. So yeah, that probably did damage me. Here's the thing. Like I get, I, I get what you're saying. Like, so via, if you take a look at PowerShell, it's largely informed from Unix. It's largely informed from VMS, AS400 and some others, right? But VMS DCL, right? When I first started using that, I was a Unix guy, and then I started using this, and I was like, oh, I hate this thing, I hate this thing, I hate this thing, and I kept trying to make it be the Unix shell, and it wasn't. And when I finally stopped, got my head out of my butt, and said, okay, just deal with the tool the way it is. What is it? How is, what's its point of view on things? I realized, wow, this is an amazing tool, and I, I learned to love it. So my guess is that you're, you're in that resistance phase, like, it's not the thing I'm used to, as opposed to, and by the way, if, if you don't have to use it, you can use your tool that you like. But I would suggest to you just like, hey, stop resisting it, stop trying to make it be what you're used to, learn the core concepts, and I think you'll like it. I mean, certainly people have. It's really nice and consistent. You know, Jesus can use it. Just walk up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think you took those very well. I was, I was worried. You know, I didn't want to make you cry or anything. <laughs> tweets, but uh, you, you handled those well. So, so uh, thanks for being a good you sure, sport with you that. You sure the mean tweets I got from Microsoft executives trying to bring a <laughs> command line interface into Windows. I had one, like, just tweeting about this recently, about the guy who, who ran Windows ME. He was the exec that told me, Jeffrey, exactly what part of effing windows is confusing you it's like oh well i mean the guy running <laughs> me let's not really take anything <laughs> connect the dots my yeah. friend you got it <laughs> guessing he's not running anything right now uh all right so, so uh i don't know microsoft has moved to virtual events now so do you, do you have yeah. anything coming up or do you have any speaking events uh that you're doing i'm gonna do a live uh, uh interview at build and then uh, ignite we're gonna have a few things Ignite's what, and then like November, when, when is build now? Yeah, I got to tell you, my heart is saddened that we're not going to be in New Orleans. Man, that's I was my excited favorite for that. city in the world. Yeah, we're, we're up the road um, from the Orlando ones. We're about an hour and a half drive down. Oh, so the yeah, last yeah. couple of years we've done that, but I was looking forward to going out to New Orleans this year. For, yeah, for New Orleans, the food is so great. You know, you just, uh, you know, you get your phone and you update the Bail Bonds application mm -hmm. and sure. you just go to New Orleans. <laughs> just hose awesome. yourself off every night. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft, Microsoft build starts next week. Next week. Oh, yep. wow. May yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah. 
So it's good. Yeah, it's an experiment. You know, a lot of our a lot of our other people have just like canceled theirs, and we decided, hey, we're gonna take a risk. We 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 could embarrass ourselves, right? This could be bad, but we have a we're gonna try it, and we'll see, and uh, and then learn what works, what doesn't. So love to hear what people's experiences are with build. Well, people will be a lot less hungover uh, in the sessions than than they are <laughs> at at Ignite and. <laughs> so so that'll be good so that's positive hey uh jeffrey thank you so much for taking the time with us today yeah it's been my pleasure thank you so much for having me yeah i'm glad uh we got to ask you a lot of fun questions yeah. there but uh, and everybody should try powershell version 7 cross-platform fast as the wind it's available in jupiter notebooks crazy stuff i'm really holding out for version 8 i hear it's better yeah <laughs> <laughs> Every version's better. Every version's better, my friend. I'm gonna skip over nine, just like Windows. There you go. I assume. We'll find out. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It's a prediction. I'm putting it out there now. All right. Well, thank you. Hey, we've got more Technado coming up, but we're gonna take a quick break. Then we're gonna get to the news right after this here on Technado with Don Pizzette. See you then. Will you be in or near Gainesville, Florida, anytime soon? Then you should come see IT Pro TV. Make plans to visit the studios. Get a tour. Meet your favorite entertainer. See what goes on behind the scenes every day to bring the best of classroom learning to IT professionals around the world. Simply chat with the member services team on the IT Pro TV website and let us know when you'll be visiting. We'll see you soon. All right, welcome back to TechNado with Don Pizzette, and uh, thank you to Jeffrey for joining us. Also, thank you to Cherokee and Mike for stepping in because we don't know what Justin or Daniel would have said. It would have went something like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I keep getting muted every time I say that. <laughs> well, you would have defended, you know, Bash and stuff when he was talking about how horrible it was compared. Oh to yeah, that. that had been throwdown right there. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, See, Don, I told you. We Don, how, how, did, how did you thing. stand it, Don? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How'd you deal with that? He's actually a really positive guy. <laughs> he's kind of missed out on the interview. But uh, but I, I said, you know, if we covered the mean tweets, it would have been four mean tweets from you and Justin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very disappointed you didn't submit any. All right. Well, let's get to the news uh, this week. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. The first one is from ArsTechnico.com. Caddy offers TLS, HTTPS, and more in one dependency-free Go web server. We put Caddy 2.0.0 head-to-head against a ranking heavyweight, Apache 2.4.41. I can't wait to find out who came out on top. So there's a, there's a measurable but small difference between production-level Caddy 2.0, and uh, the article actually goes through setting up similar um, Caddy and Apache. Nginx was left out of there, but that's okay. So Caddy draw some interest to me because if you've ever had to set up an Apache web server with all their virtual host files, uh, I mean, there's crying, there's tears, there's possible mon monitor punching. Uh, Caddy is very simple. It uses JSON or also known as a Caddy file. You just, boop, there it is. And you can set up TLS, um, static web serving, file serving, and use it as a reverse proxy all in one. The one thing that, uh, that draws an interest, but possibly an ire, is it has an API where you can use curl to update its configuration. And as I say that, I suspect people like Daniel will be like, oh, that's awesome. I'm yeah. just going to start adding new routes that's all to you gotta, Caddy. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Here's a Caddy file. Yeah, here you go. Oh, well, I have this. my own very own reverse proxy <laughs> that you're hosting for me. Um, but yeah, Caddy is uh, easy to install. They've updated their installed instructions. And it just makes me happy to see something easier to set up than Apache. I mean, I know Don's a pro at it, but I am not. And Justin, I know that uh, Caddy is written in Go. Does that matter or like, do we get any benefit from that? So Go does have a pretty good concurrency story, so it should have uh, no issues. I mean, originally Apache had some issues with scaling beyond 10,000 connections, uh, but they've changed some of their models and kind of uh, some of their concurrency models like add-ons. So you get pretty good scalability with Apache, but with Go, Go routines, then you should have pretty good scaling, should be pretty fast. The one thing that draws me toward Caddy is it's all one binary. There's no dependencies, everything's all together, and I should be able to move it from system to system. And because it's written in Go, uh, I should be able to deploy it for every major operating system if I so choose. So there should be a Linux version that's 
one binary, a Windows version that's one binary, and a uh, Mac version that's one binary. Now, I don't know why you would use Windows, but uh, <laughs> Go does offer that capability. You know, it's funny because we had another guest who just talked about that. Yeah. You know, deploy it with PowerShell after like, you know, 103 lines of code. Yeah. <laughs> Get dash caddy dash switch. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Dash run dash yeah. port on TCP. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. IIS. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. IIS. No, I, I haven't used caddy. Is it? Is it? Production suitable, or is it more of just dev environment? Uh, no, it's it's production suitable. It is one of those where I, I've used it here and there. Uh, what drew it to drew me to it was the JSON configuration or the caddy file. Um, so, admittedly, so I've used it mostly in dev, um, but I forget right offhand. I don't have them in front of me. Who uses it in production? Um, should be a replacement for Apache. With that said, I suspect it's not going to be on government computers. Anytime soon, Apache kind of runs the roost there. Uh, so fun times. Not IIS four. <laughs> <laughs> well, only if you're accessing it with Internet Explorer six. Justin, yes, you are. Have you downloaded two point and played with that yet? Um, oh, no, I have not. I've only played with one point So is so. This article is specifically talking about like upgrades that they've made though, and uh, which are apparently pretty substantial. And, yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so yeah, 1.0 was was fun playing around with it. The 2.0, I'll have to definitely dig in. It was just interesting to see um, a project like this continuing to move forward with all kinds of uh, uncertain times, so to speak. What's funny at the bottom of the article, uh, it says it has the good, the bad, the ugly, and under the ugly, it says uh, very low web server market share, less than 0.1 uh, percent, yep. according to W3 Techs. Yeah, uh, I mean. Apache is run on a lot of things. Yeah, I've heard of Apache. Yeah. <laughs> I've uh, heard of that one. Uh, Nginx <laughs> yeah. is a, a fairly large market share as well. But everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, like you talked about, uh, Apache with uh, all the processes that it spins off and stuff, I can totally see this being a, a viable solution. Yeah, started from the bottom. Now they're here. <laughs> all right. Uh, next over at AndroidPolice.com, Google Authenticator gets its first update in years. Finally lets you transfer accounts between devices uh, with an APK download. It also doesn't look so painfully 2017-ish now. I don't have this, I don't think. I've I've got the one for Salesforce we use here, and then sure. I have another one, but so not Google's. At this stage, everybody knows the multi-factor authentication is super-duper important, and most websites do have where you can scan a QR code into an app on your phone, and now you've got that uh, uh, one-time password that's being generated every 60 or 30 seconds on your phone. Everybody knows how important that is. And Google was one of the first to market with an authenticator app uh, that you could run right on your phone, and they did it for Android as well as iOS. And it was because they wanted MFA for or Google services. But for me, it was always a showstopper that there was no way to move an authentication credential from one device to another. So like when I had a, I had a Galaxy S7, I think, and then I, when I went to the Galaxy S8... When it exploded. You know, well, yeah. So when <laughs> I went to the bombs 8, until later. <laughs> there was no way to move your credentials over. And so I had to go to every site that I had loaded into the Google Authenticator and turn off MFA and turn it back on again to get new QR codes to scan them in. Well, at the time, I had like five accounts, and that was super annoying. Now I have like 50 accounts. So that's a showstopper. I haven't even dreamed of using the Google Authenticator since then. Uh, so it's nice to see that they have finally introduced that to allow you to move that from one phone to another. Uh, by the way, I checked again, and it turns out that is the authenticator I have. I did not realize that. <laughs> I love that. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Hey, I look at it now and go, oh, that's a G. Yeah. That's a G in the logo. You did I thought it was a six. <laughs> oh, you, know, it, it, you know, you guys have been doing this for years, but it's funny, like, you know, we just recently started doing the two-factor and stuff. At, well, not recently, but, you know, in the last couple of years or so. And... I remember the first time I downloaded this, I didn't really know what this was because, you know, you get the text and you get a code and you have, you know, 10 minutes to put the code in. The first time I opened this up, it, like, I didn't realize, you know, it was always refreshing. And it, I had about two seconds left with the code. I'm like, how the hell am I supposed to be able to do this without? <laughs> and then I'm telling somebody, and by the time I look back, I got two seconds left on that one. So it took me a while to realize that. Yeah. It, just wait a second. It is a cold sweat inducing because you're like, I got to type. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's uh -oh. red. Uh -oh. It's red. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm a, hit enter. Oh, it expired. I got to do it again. What do you mean I'm looking for streetlights now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro. 
<laughs> you know, the uh, the dark secret on these things that, that they don't usually talk about is that most of the providers actually allow the codes to go on for twice their lifetime. So like but you can still type it in. Yeah. So you try it next time, wait until the code expires and then punch it in. And like nine times out of 10, it'll work. This is really probably some trick that's going to be like, you are locked out of this account now for, like, <laughs> for three days. Formatting hard drive. That's like You're back when I was format. a kid and I would tell my nephew when he was playing Super Mario Brothers, hey, if you jump down that hole, there's a secret level. <laughs> <laughs> that, he didn't like that. My turn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think the, the, you know, the old industry standard recommendation was to rotate them every 60 seconds. And so they started setting them to 30 seconds. But then it actually works for 60 seconds, but it does rotate every 30. So it, it's, a, it's a weird one, but it takes a little pressure off. It looks like it has dark mode now, too, which is Ooh. probably more exciting than it, no, it's security more stuff. Thank yeah, you. it's more secure. Yeah, there's darker <laughs> pixels. People it, can't see them as easily. It concern, like, it kind of makes me sad. Don't get me wrong. I run dark mode on a few things. Not, not Mac, for some reason. It's weird. Um, that seems to be one of the biggest feature... T- Features touted anytime there's a new release in like the last six months. Be like, we have dark mode now. You should check it out. Like, is that like that's does that draw of, y'all that's in? A full update these days <laughs> yeah. to people. I don't know. I guess if you had everything in dark mode and then you open this one app and it just like, you know, your retinas exploded, maybe. Every time I see somebody announce dark mode, I think of there was an old flash video about Star Wars and uh, it was like a, a rap video or something and, and at one point they had the death star in the background and their stormtroopers waving their hands they're like we got death star we got death star and that's what i think of you know we got dark mode, <laughs> we got dark mode. <laughs> that's what pops in my head every time i see it there for a second i was like i have no idea where god's going yeah, I got god's going to you just gotta give me a minute <laughs> i was like so all dark modes have death stars i was confused now i gotta look it up well actually i can't look it up right because flash videos don't work anymore that's right. No, you should update Flash. <laughs> I'll install it. I got that shockwave. That'll work. Yeah. It's right here on adobeflash.ru. Yeah. <laughs> Things are running the multimedia version. Yeah. Is Silverlight still a thing? <laughs> I, we should have asked Jeffrey. That's a yeah. good question. You would know. I was told that was the future once. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. lying to That was a while back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next article is over at securityboulevard.com. And this, I feel like, is exactly what we just talked about of, you know, smart people tricking the, the naive uh, young kid playing Super Mario Brothers into jumping down the hole because uh, they told me how to, how to pronounce this name and I don't believe them. So I'm just going to butcher it and, and let you guys fix it. So Xiaomi, U-turn, admits sending private data. It said it didn't. Is that right? I think it's you're I you're think so. you're asking God. No, no. <laughs> it's actually pronounced Xiaomi. Xiaomi. <laughs> Seriously? No, it, it's show me. Oh, show me. That's show me. So there's a trend in X-I-A. Chinese companies right now where they will use what are, are obviously Chinese names, yeah, but that align with English words. Oh, that makes sense. And it? so you know, like uh, like Huawei. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's a Chinese word, but they they wanted it to kind of sound fun in the English language, and show me does that. X-I-A-O-M-I. Well, anyway, uh, show me U-turn admits sending private data. It said it shouldn't. So way to try to distract me with your cool name, but <laughs> you're sending my data when you don't shouldn't. Look, don't what, look over here. What, what, kind I, of, what kind of company is this? I enjoyed this because uh, they were like, yeah, we're not doing that, but here's a patch that makes it stop. <laughs> <laughs> if we were, this yeah, would fix if it. If that were to happen, man, this is going to put it on lockdown. So you just go ahead and opt on into that. It'll be good to go. We didn't do that, by the way. None of this is going to Russia or Singapore or any of those other places with server farms that we own and control and are watching everything you do. So, so yeah. <laughs> this, this is a phone company, though? This is a, a yeah, hardware? They make the uh, Redmi phones. So, like, the Redmi Note 8, which I, I think they say in the article somewhere was, like, the number one Android phone last year, sales-wise. I, I, yeah, it, uh, I believe you're right, Don. They did say that. They, I, that's unbelievable. That. I never that seen one. would be, but there are a lot of people in that area of the world. So maybe there's a lot of people. Sense. There's a lot of people in the U.S. that use the the phones because they are lower priced. Yeah, so it's a lot of probably the like the Android ones, the ones that are. Hold you know. on, what have I got in my pocket now? <laughs> <laughs> show me. Yeah. No, uh, show. But if you want to have a good time, I would definitely read through all the like basically the internet fighting that went on inside of this. Uh, they kind of posted the the person that was um, posting this article basically curated all the best bits of what are you doing with my data? And them going, we're not doing anything at all, but we will stop or we'll at least ask you to opt in to not doing that. 
My favorite's the one here with the clapping emoji, the stop sending my data. Yeah, the uh, the sassy clap. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the mean tweet segment that we just did. Yeah. Like <laughs> but in, in an article and with a PR company. Uh, so that's fun. So yeah, take a read uh, on that one over at securityboulevard.com and uh, send it in the comments your ways that you would uh, pronounce that name. Uh, all right, this R- one. R- real quick. Oh, yeah. How are, 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 do you have to, like, put a phonetic spelling in there? Cause... Sure. Okay. You have I to send just me a video sure. of you pronouncing the word. Say, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So a video, it's a link to a video. I thought you were asking me to, like, type how you would pronounce this. Yeah, I want the phonetic spelling. That's fine. Uh... That's and while you're at it, uh, if you could uh, pronounce uh, Elon Musk's kid's name. Ah. Well, yeah, what is that? That would be a great one. Yeah, like Pilot Inspector. It's like it's it's pronounced just like it's written. I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know yeah. what those I think it's are. pronounced Aeon Flux. Which is not English characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of him, though, uh, also on ArsTechnica.com, a hacker buys old Tesla parts on eBay and finds them full of user data. Data can be retrieved even after owners perform a factory reset, a researcher says. So uh, proving the old adage that a, a drill through the disk is still the best way. Uh, I assume to get the data off there, right? I saw the solid state. Oh yeah. Well, then when you, you just put a drill through the solid state. This time? reminds me of an art, not an article. I um, I think it was like uh, sixty minutes or twenty twenty or something that I watched when I was much younger. Man, I had more hair on the top of my head instead of the facial area. Uh, that they were uh, people were stealing or breaking into where people kept printers, like the line of business type of printers, and they were stealing the hard drives out of them for the data. I'm like, man. <laughs> The old tricks are the best tricks right here. It's just wrapped around a Tesla now. Yeah, exactly. So I guess I'm assuming people are maybe buying wrecked ones or... Is it as hard to print to a Tesla as it is a normal printer? <laughs> no, you, you could totally print to a Tesla much easier. Oh, okay. So uh, in this case, I, I think there was like one or two that were recovered from a junkyard, but the rest, they were purchasing them off of eBay. And the story is that in the location data inside of the unit, the last place they showed up was at the Tesla service center. So it looked like people were taking their vehicles in to have them serviced and the computers were being replaced. And when that happens, Tesla has a policy in place that says... If there's enough damage to it, then you just need to basically bash it with a hammer and throw it in the trash, right? They say crush it to to kill the silicon. Uh, If it's not damaged, you have to send it back into Tesla headquarters where they process it and deal with it there. And it looks like a bit of a black market has started where potentially Tesla employees are flagging the computers as destroyed and then turning around and selling them on eBay or, or on the side. And unfortunately, if you if you are a Tesla owner, you take it in for service, they put a new computer in there, you don't necessarily think about, was my data protected? It, and it'll actually restore your data to the system. So you just assume everything was handled right. And what the security researcher found was that that's not the case, that he's buying these used units. I think he bought like 14 of them, quite, quite a few, and was able to find all the location data, so where the vehicle had been, the cell phone contact list. Uh, apparently, you can link Netflix and Spotify and other services to your Tesla. I don't understand it the Netflix like part. an issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the credentials are all there. Wi-Fi passwords are stored in plain text. Uh, you know, just a, a treasure trove of PII located right on the hardware. Oh, and it says your YouTube account, which means your attached Gmail account as well. So they're in your email as well. That's. Huh, that's kind of frightening. I'm more concerned with the way you say the name of that company, Don. It sounds like it sounds like you've got a Z in there. Yeah, it's Italian. Okay, let's... <laughs> <laughs> Nikola Tesla. <laughs> All right. If you call his mom, he's not going to say Tesla. <laughs> well, this is an American company. America. <laughs> got eagles with... Sunglasses on, <laughs> flying over jets, <laughs> Dr- driving Corvettes, F and A. All right, um, get on eBay. Nobody can buy that. that Tesla hard drive. <laughs> All right, this next article is from ZDNet.com. Hackers hide web skimmer behind a website's favicon. Hackers created a fake image hosting portal to hide a web skimming operation. So why would they do that? To, to get your stuff, I'm guessing. Well, there's a uh, the the picture, the clip art here is a guy holding his credit card. So I'm assuming to get that credit card is why they did it. This one is awesome. Daniel, skimmer. do you have a chance to look at it? Uh, just a little bit. It, it, they put like basically malicious clo- code inside of a web app that records your 
your credit card information as you type. Yeah. Just like, so like logging keystrokes? This is so ingenious. So what they did is uh, there is an icon website out there uh, whose name I'm Favicon? forgetting. Um, yeah, they have fav- favicons, and I, I'm trying to remember the legitimate site. Uh, uh, myicons.net? No, that, that's the bad one. Oh, okay. There's a, there's that's a, the one that Peter's been going to. Yeah. <laughs> so that's wrong, what you're saying. So what they did is they cloned a legitimate icon website. For favorite icons, and Daniel, you showed me before, like how easy it was oh, yeah. to clone a website. But what was the tool you used? Um, oh man, uh, you can do it with a bunch of different tools. Like Skipfish will do it. Basically, I think SE Toolkit might uh, uh, do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it was the it was the SE Toolkit that you showed me. Yeah. So they cloned a legit fave icon site, and they called it MyIcons.net. And people would discover the site through various means. You know, they sent out emails that look like advertisements for the site, but are kind of borderline phishing at that point. And if you used a fave icon from their site, it would actually render the fave icon. So you, you would get that little one that shows up in the tab in your web browser, and it would work the way that they expected. But it actually was able to check on your website. So on, on, on the majority of the pages, it would just send the icon like you expected. But then if it was a shopping cart web page, Instead of sending the fave icon, it would send malicious scripts to render a fake purchase form. And so then you would punch in your credit card number, your address, and all that other stuff into this fake form that would be intercepted and sent over to this other site. So, you know, most people don't really think twice about fave icons. And, you know, you might be on a site that has one, and then you go to the checkout page and the icon disappears. Most people wouldn't even notice that. And in this case, it was, it was pretty sophisticated. Uh, and it sounds like this has, uh, has been going on for a little while. Uh, I see. Uh, my icons on it was a clone of legitimate iconarchive.com. Oh, uh, that's it. Yep. So, yeah, if you're meant to be using that one, make sure that that, that address is right because it looks like some uh, some larger uh, companies were caught up in this. Magento, an Adobe company, uh, looks like their um, their website was was using a my icons. Uh, one as well and so yeah yeah you know if you're if you're a web designer or web developer and you want a fave icon you don't really think twice about oh here's this company that's hosting one i can just link it right in and i'm done so i'm, I'm interested to see if magento's website's using it but magento's like an e-commerce platform that you can use to develop additional shopping carts did Maybe. they have my icons hard-coded in the magento source code <laughs> So in this case, uh, I think it depends on how you're leveraging it. Because, you know, most people, when they when they do like a Magento shopping cart or whatever, they are either doing uh, an iframe and embedding the checkout in their own page, in which case it would be their local fave icon that gets rendered. Uh, if you actually hand off to Magento, which I don't know if that's what was happening here, then it would be up to them to render it. So in theory, yeah, they could be creating the compromise. And yeah, maybe this was just in the Magento CMS is what, what they're showing here. Not sure. I don't want to. Don't want to call them out if it wasn't them. But, um, but definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I hate to say, a, a, oh, cool, cool hack. But yeah, kind of cool hack. But um, one to keep an eye out for. I always feel weird about like what they're doing is completely wrong and immoral and horrible and it's like hurting people and taking their hard earned money. Like, neat. But man, was that cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like what you did was wrong. The way you did it was awesome. Yeah, hats off to you, but <laughs> yeah. still go to jail. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Prison time. You deserve to be Enjoy there. your celly. I hope you guys get along. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a new BFF. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, all right. Hey, I uh, want to let you know about a couple things coming up. First, we have a uh, webinar coming up on Thursday, May 21st, succeeding with the new Cisco certifications. Uh, tips from the IT pros, that's Anthony Sequera and Ronnie Wong doing that Thursday, May 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Now, there's been a lot of changes there uh, with the Cisco stuff, so uh, that'll definitely be a good one to check out. We've also yeah. got... Go I can't ahead. believe they greenlit that one over my suggestion of failing with the new Cisco certifications, but they wanted the success side of it. <laughs> Shoot, I could teach the failing with just it. Just one side of that story. Peter's an SME and failing. Yeah, I, just, I should. I should do a, a webinar on that. How to <laughs> webinar? How to fail fast and hard? Yeah, IT fundamentals <laughs> failed. Didn't you, know it could happen. You watch a lot of Netflix while you're studying you know peter you, you did the um uh the sample videos of like how to do a bad job interview yeah. and, and things so you you kind of have become our mascot of failure I, 
<laughs> can I uh, put that on my resume? <laughs> I think so. Can I Only if it, the official title is mascot of failure. Yeah. If you need a tire fire in your industry, just call me, <laughs> Peter Van Rysdom. I got you. I'll stack them high and light them up. It'll smell like sulfurous <laughs> bagasse. Num, num. Uh, if, you, yeah, if, you, if you want to look better at your job, get me hired. I'll, I'll sit next to you. All right, uh, that's over at itpro.tv slash webinar, so check that out, and don't fail like me. And while you're on the internet, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado, where you can get a coupon code for 30% off the lifetime of your uh, personal membership. You can also uh, fill out a form to get a demo of the Teams features for businesses, so that's all at go.itpro.tv slash technado and hey i know we've got a free weekend happening this weekend which i don't know what the dates are on this weekend uh this weekend is the uh, 16th and 17th and uh we've got a free powershell weekend so if you're watching this right after it came out and you enjoyed jeffrey snover stuff but didn't know what the heck he was talking about uh you can binge all the powershell content uh this week um, head over to itpro.tv and you can just sign up for a free account and you're good to go. It's kind of like the HBO free weekends or anything like that. And uh, yeah, remember otherwise to subscribe, um, comment, share with your friends. Uh, that, that's it, right? Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, again, thank you to Jeffrey Snover for coming on. I know he's a very busy man. And as he said, you know, kind of busier than normal during the pandemic. So uh, thank you to him for coming on. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today and uh, enlightening us and teaching me how to pronounce words. I really appreciate that. And good clothes. Good clothes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yo, Justin just always sits there through the whole clothes like, not even going to mm -hmm. say you're welcome. I'm just mad. I'm, I'm working on a uh, Simpsons intro for you, like the... Uh, uh, you know how the... He says he writes something different on the chalkboard no, each time. No, the, the, the actor guy who's like, I'm so-and-so, you might Troy, recognize me. Oh, Troy yeah. McClure, I'm you Troy might, McClure. Yeah. I'm Peter Van Rysdom. You might recognize me from videos such as how not to do a job interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having my pants off. How to fail at a Cisco certification. Yeah, yeah, I got it. All right, well, we'll work on that, and uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll have that by next week. Uh, but we will see you then. Thanks so much for watching. See you on the next Tech Nato with Don Bill.